Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Contact Loss, the podcast about the Polish competitive Warhammer 40k scene. Uh, today we're going to discuss some Gene Steer cults, and with me is your usual host, Tweak. Hello, hello, hello. And today we have a very special guest, a first timer at our podcast. And if you'd think that it's weird to emigrate from the UK to Poland, then what have you got to say for someone that plays Gene Steer Cults with an 8th edition book in the middle of night? So uh, please welcome the one and only, the cult hero, the Kalimov that wants to be the Primus, Danny. Hey, thank you for having me. What a beautiful introduction. Thanks, I, I really tried. Yeah, I'm also impressed. You did an amazing job. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Oh, the positivity. I'm already <laughs> feeling better. Right, um, so uh, let's just jump straight into it, right? So Gene Steer Cults, uh, maybe uh, actually, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself? Because you've been playing them recently before it was cool, because it's obviously going to be cool now. Uh, mm -hmm. So where did that come from? Okay, so uh, all right, so I guess a little bit about myself. Um, in terms of competitive experience, I would say I'm a relative. I was a relatively new player. My first real tournaments were in 2021. So I started at the end of eighth when just before lockdown happened, and then lockdown happened, and I had to then play on TTS. And then uh, at the start of 2021, I because I love Death Guard, I, I bought Death Guard, and then. After having a few games and constantly playing against Typhus and then losing against Typhus, it was a case of we agreed that Death Guard's not really a good army to sort of learn because that's what I wanted to do. So I always love Gene Sealers, uh, all the models. So I decided no one plays it. It's a really tricksy army. It's really hard to play. Uh, so naturally, <laughs> it's probably the best one to learn. Because uh, if you can win with that codex, you can win with any codex. So I picked up the army, I got smashed about a thousand times, uh, and then slowly but surely I tried consistently new things, constantly evolving my, my craft, my army, my list, and uh, yeah, I started picking up quite a lot of wins in tournaments. I didn't win any tournaments, but uh, you know, I was generally, I think, 60% win ratio across a lot of tournaments, so uh, yeah, I was doing quite well, I would say. Was the Polish scene welcoming for you know a foreigner with a new uh, army? Honestly, you know what my biggest concern when I first moved here and I so when I first moved here I picked up 40k because I thought I really need a hobby to meet new people um, and I quite like the idea of also being able to paint and, and build some models so I got into 40k and then I was thinking to myself you know what I'm actually kind of nervous at how people might react to me uh, but honestly everyone has been super supportive everyone speaks English when I, you know, when I'm struggling with Polish, uh, and honestly, it's probably the nicest collection of people, um, except when they play against you and they smash you, that's a little bit different, <laughs> but other than that, no, I think that the community is so open and welcoming and, and absolutely fantastic, so. Picking up 40k to meet people, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a new one, but it does work, actually, it's a very social game. Yeah, no, definitely is. Uh... Right, okay, so thanks for that. And let's jump st straight to the topic now. So Gene Steer Cults have got or are about to get a new book. Mm. Any hot takes? You excited? You bummed? Okay, um, <clears throat> okay, so this might, uh, some people might disagree, but for me, this book, <laughs> this Name book you is, one. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, uh, not, not saying any Vladdy's, but no, no, um, I'm joking. For me, this book is absolutely amazing. It is everything that I wanted in the book. So uh, when I played, when I was playing Gene Steelers and Ape, what I really liked about them was that they had a lot of tricks. They had some damage, but you, your mistakes were always punished. And I always said to myself, I said, right, when the new codex comes forward, I would like this to continue this, this trend of utility, um, of damage, speed, but also I like the skill element of the army. And then they added more damage, uh, but they kept this squishiness in there. So, and I really like that because it really pushes you as a player, but it's not like Drukari where you can just go and table someone in two turns. You've got to really think about how you do it. And it's, it's an absolutely phenomenal book. Um, 
is it the strongest book in the game? Probably not, uh, because the flaws are there. But in terms of fun, in terms of its potential, is uh, is really good. I think maybe A plus tier in terms of the strengths overall. Uh, but the better the player, like Harlequins, the better the player, the more they really can push this codex into like new levels of, of creativity and um, and successes. I think so. It's, it's looking really good. So have you already had some time or some chance to to play with the codex? <laughs> okay. Put yeah, it in the yeah. So I, I got the code. So I got the codex sent to me as PDF uh, by a friend on Friday. So I, I spent most of the day reading the codex and writing down stuff and sort of making combinations and and building the list. And then I had a bit of an RTT last Saturday. And then as soon as I got home, I went on my computer and I played three games straight. So from 6 p.m. till about 4 a.m. I was playing. And then I got up at about 9 a.m. and then started playing again um, against some Americans. And then I, you know, so basically Sunday I played throughout the entire day on Sunday, all the way through Sunday night, got up again early uh, Monday morning. Uh, and I've just been constantly playing outside of work uh, ever since. So I'm doing averaging two to three games a night, hopefully one in the morning. I've got one at 5 a.m. tomorrow. So uh, I'm trying my best to get as many games as possible to sort of expand, learn, uh, come up with new ideas. And, and basically when we can go to a tournament with this codex, I should I want to be in a good position to really get the most out of it. And do the new contents of the book, so I don't know, stratagems, new mechanics and so on, do they start working? working organically for you or do, you know do, do you need to devote some proper attention to reading through them and so on and, and to putting them into practice what was it like so uh yeah i think um so yeah i think the book doesn't change massively in terms of how i played the army in eight um which was really good for me because it's allowed me to sort of pick up the book uh and understand actually how some units work whereas a lot of a lot of people played a different kind of style uh, I would say I was very unique in how I approached the army. Um, and so they picked up the book and they might be a little confused. There's not a lot of people that quite understand how the units are meant to work, especially new people that come over um, that have never played Gene Steelers and they're like, what, I don't get to save on anything. What is, what is this kind of, uh, this, this ridiculous uh, rule set? But for me, because uh, the play style is still very similar, um, I yeah I, I think I able to pick it up really quickly. My first game I played it with it. It was quite a mess actually, mostly because I was trying to do a new system. And what I've done actually now is I've sort of taken the book and I'm playing it as I did in eighth, and it's going really well. And uh, there was a lot of stratagems uh, that have sort of kept familiar, but also moved into the system. So things like line in weight, which allows you to deep strike within three inches. Uh, things like that are still kept in. Uh, and then they, they removed a lot of the cool stuff, but then added a lot of new cool stuff as well. But it's nothing that really pushes the play style miles away from what it was. It's more adding a little bit of nuance and a little bit of extra creativity into the game. So yeah, I think it was pretty simple to pick up essentially. The more complex thing I think was playing around the new Crossfire system, but Honestly, once you play with the models and once you start uh, building the strategies in there, it's really easy to pick up, I think. So can so, you, yeah, can you tell us about that, that crossfire mechanic? Because, you know, to me, as a person who barely touches gene stealers or barely experiences them, to be honest, I, you know, I've seen the article on, on Warhammer community. I've, I've, I, I skimmed through it. OK, new mechanic, cool. And, you know, I carried on with my life. So mm. to the player who is going to be using that for the remainder of the edition probably, if not longer. Uh, is that something useful? Is that something handy? Is that something that you were waiting for? <clears throat> um, honestly, for me, it is probably one of the best mechanics in the game. Uh, wow. Mostly because, uh, for two reasons. First of all, the biggest problem for me with Gene Steelers in 8th wasn't the defensiveness or the fact that we were paper. It was the fact that there was a limited amount of efficiency that you could put out with the army. Um, so getting a shooting support system for all of your melee acolytes or your metamorphs, uh, you had to really rely on, on Hiveguard, as, as we've all seen, uh, to really provide efficient shooting. 
So to provide to pop transports or to kill something that you don't want to kill with your metamorphs and your acolytes, um, you really lack that in the eighth edition codex. And what this system's actually done is it's incorporated incorporated a way that you no longer need to soup. You can absolutely create a full entire shooting list if you wanted. But if you are going the same sort of route that I do, where you, you build around a really brick squad of board control with your melee units, but you provide some really strong shooting support, it's driven some really hyper efficient uh, hyper efficiency into the codex, which is absolutely phenomenal. Um, being able to hit on, on an army that hits on fours, being able to hit on threes, wound on twos, threes, and fours um, is really amazing, to be honest with you. And I, I absolutely love it. I think it's really good for the codex, really good for the army. The other reason as well is that it's not a simple system. Let's look at power from pain. All I have to do is look at a chart and determine what round it is. And I've got that buff. But with this, you've got to plan around it. You've got to think around it. It is really in depth for what it offers you because you've got to make sure that A, you've got enough um, crossfire markers in your army when you build your list. You've got enough units that can take advantage of the crossfire markers and you've got units that are speedy enough to be able to provide exposed as well um but then also you've got to be able to know how to put the crossfire markers on other units that maybe you want to charge and give no overwatch or fight last so there's a lot of skill around how you can utilize the system as well and i think uh the more better players of the world will really push this system beyond its limits and for me, that's a lot more exciting than a lot of systems we've got in place. Okay, so um, <clears throat> how does it work exactly, if you'd mind explaining? What okay. does it do? Okay, basically, all right, so most of the units that can shoot, um, so aberrants can't shoot, so they don't have it, uh, but most of the units that can shoot have a keyword called crossfire. And what happens is if you manage to land five hits with damage one or one hit with uh, more than damage one, so damage two plus or damage D3, you get a crossfire um, token onto that unit that you that you target. Now, if any unit with the crossfire keyword shoot that target, they get plus one to hit. So, for example, five flamers acolytes or three flamers could get five auto hits and you get a marker. And then your neophytes that hit on fours naturally now hit on threes. So it's really good with that regard. If you hit, um, if you target that unit, the enemy unit on the other side of uh, your original targeting model. So you've got one, you, the enemy units in the middle, you've got um, your flamer acolytes on the left, but then you've got your actual neophyte hybrids on the right. They also get plus one to wound. And if they're within 12 inches, they ignore cover. So it's, this is why it's really good at creating efficiency um, because there's a lot of creativity in, in how it works in the codex that many units can really take advantage of this plus one to win, plus one to hit, and no cover save. So you need to flank the unit that you want to destroy. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and there are ways to do that in the codex that push it further. Okay, uh, right. And you've mentioned that uh, some mechanics have returned, some have changed. So what about those? So mainly, um, as Gene Steel already had a signature mechanic, you could say, and the form of uh, blip markers, the co ambush, mm -hmm. if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken. And uh, then obviously, there's, I think there's been some changes to unquestioning loyalty as well. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just quickly give you a heads up mm -hmm. of what's changed. So uh, let's talk about unquestioned loyalty. Unquestioned loyalty is uh, pretty much the same, except now if it's a character that's a patriarch, um, it, you get it on a three plus. So for every model, um, every character, it's a four plus, And if it's a patriarch, it's a three plus. And unquestioned loyalty, for those that don't know, that is if you've got a, um, a Brood Brothers unit or any other cool, um, uh, like infantry unit or even a character you and a character nearby fails a saving throw on a four plus they can pass that uh, damage off onto uh, a nearby brood brothers unit or um, cult unit or, or anything like that model uh, the problem is though is if you pass it off that model takes that model is destroyed it doesn't take a mortal wound it's destroyed so you want to do it with cheap chaff like your neophytes or your brood brothers but what and it not your aberrants. Mm. Uh, no, not your aberrants. 
Um, and definitely not, uh, yeah, yeah, nothing that is expensive. Uh, definitely you want to do it on Neophytes or, or Brew Brothers. But what it does allow you to do is uh, if your Patriarch fails a D3 plus 3 damage weapon, um, just throw that for one damage on, t for one, yeah, one instant, just insta kill model. Um, so there are some swingy ways about it to sort of really take advantage of that rule. In addition to that, there's the conceal rule and the ambush rule. Uh, so conceal is what uh, we used to have as, I think, ambush or cool ambush or something like that. Basically, it's just our deep strike. And conceal allows you to set up a unit in deep strike or on a blip. And if you set it in deep strike, it's now called ambush. Um, no, it's called underground. So if you are underground, you are in deep strike and for the first time that that model deep strikes, it can be set up eight inches, not nine inches anymore. So now it can be set up within eight inches or you can set up within six inches and not shoot. Uh, and that's actually really, uh, really good because it just sort of creates a little bit more easier way to score some secondaries, I would say. Also, it forces your opponent to have to screen that little bit further and those extra three inches uh, can make quite a lot of difference, uh, especially towards the later end of the game or turn three, when the backfield might be a little bit more exposed. So it just gives a little bit more freedom and leeway for the Gene Stealer Cool player, I would say. Uh, in addition to that, you've got ambush markers, and thank God they've not been removed because they're an amazing mechanic. It's probably my favorite mechanic in the entire game. Uh, for those that don't know, uh, when you deploy a unit, if you're not in deep strike, you deploy it in an ambush marker and you put down a little blip. And if your opponent goes first, they cannot land within nine inches of the center. So this is really, really good at reducing alpha strike potentials. Um, it was really strong for me when we had six planes running around, flying around, because they could not get anywhere near to shoot. Um, but it's really strong as well because it gives you more agency as the player to uh, really be able to hit back, force mistakes, and then punish mistakes in your return in turns. If, you, the, if you're the player that goes first, you simply just have to set up your models um, from the ambush marker as described. Back in 8th, there was a sort of rule as written, let's say, unintentional code wording where you could set up a truck outside of your deployment, um, but they fixed that, which is fantastic news to be fair. And to the actual um, happiness of those that did abuse that, there is a buff that you can now take where a model can make a move outside of the deployment once they are deployed from a, an ambush marker. And it is a buff, it's a, I think it's 15 points. So it does give you that little bit extra flexibility that players might feel like they've lost. Um, and it's really good to play with actually. So uh, it's uh, very good that you've mentioned it because uh, let's jump to the next point then. Ninth edition codexes have the trend of uh, introducing upgrades to units for points. So how does it work here and uh, what can you take? How good are they? Okay. Um, all right. So this is again where I think people are going to, dis there, there's quite a few points I think people will disagree with me on here. Uh, this system, uh, stratagems, psychic, uh, psychic, power, you know, psychic powers and relics, people might say, oh, these aren't very good. For me, this system is incredible. Um, a lot of things that we abused in 8th edition codex, such as lying in wait, where you can deep strike just outside the three inches of any unit, but you cannot charge. Uh, I was very concerned that they would remove that because that was vital to the play style to score in rod or being able to take over um, an opponent's uh, uh, objective. But what they've done is they've left it in the book in the form of this buff. So there are, let me count you for you now, one, two, three, four, five, six. There's 10 upgrades that you can take. You can only take one upgrade, um, so they're all unique, and only one upgrade per unit. However, they're not expensive, um, and they're really flavorful, but they're also really competitive. I, I think I'm taking five to six in my current list, um, but they also allow you to play around. So for example, uh, a perfect ambush, you can give a, a Kelomorph a perfect ambush. And what that does is it allows him to drop down and he can pick out a unit within 12 inches. And every time he makes an attack against that unit, they're counting as having a crossfire marker and exposed. So he can get plus one to hit and plus one to wound. Uh, you tie that up with his relic and he's absolutely destroying uh, units left, right and center. 
and he makes him really good. Uh, there's another one called Our Time Is Nigh, as I mentioned previously, that allows you uh, a unit to come out of an ambush marker and move, uh, a normal move, not advance. But what that also allows you to do is play around a little bit. Uh, do you want to go forward? If you go first, you can get extra movement on a unit. If you didn't go first, you can use that to sort of move back away from your unit. Um, so it, a lot of these sort of give you a little bit of nuance in how you can play your list and how you can sort of just take units that a little bit further. Uh, for example, there's one uh, for the site for the Magus, the Psyche or the Patriarch that gives you an extra psychic power that you know. So for me, I don't use a Patriarch, I just use a Magus and I only need three powers. So it's, for 10 points, it's absolutely perfect. So the system is really, really well made and it's really good uh, for creativity and um, customization for your army. I think it's amazing. All right, yeah, it does sound pretty cool. I mean, and uh, like quite the useful toolkit. Like you said, if you take if five, six in, are viable, then uh, they've definitely hit the nail on the head there. Yeah, sounds yeah. like a very well written book, to be honest. Honestly, this is probably one of the best internally balanced books I've ever seen because there is not a single unit or character that I would not take. Even the, um, the meme Abominant, I would probably take him every now and then just because a D3 plus 3 damage on a melee weapon is always quite nice. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of things in this book that is phenomenal. Uh, it's really well balanced and I absolutely love it because uh, there's also a lot of challenges. So for me, one of the big challenges with this bonus system is you can absolutely take all 10 and spend what, maybe 180 points, I think, in total or something like that. Or you can take one or two. It depends. There's a lot of, um, I think, challenge in being able to get the right balance between points and what uh, units you upgrade, etc. So there's a lot of that in the book. Yeah, like, like we said, that sounds sounds really good. And I mean, I, I always like when there are lots of options and uh, you really need to think of what to take, not just go in and thrash about. So, yeah. Okay, what about, uh, you've mentioned relics, warlock traits, powers might not be as exciting, uh, but what about them? Are there any standouts? Are there any <laughs> nerfs to the ones that we've seen before? Any crazy relic pistols? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, with the warlord traits, so the, the most disappointing thing for me, I think, is warlord traits because there's not really anything that, in, outside of cult, I think the cult, cult ones are really good. Uh, we should probably touch upon cults, actually, because that's probably one of the biggest changes. But outside of cults, the warlord traits aren't really, aren't really that improved. Uh, Biomorph adaptation is my favorite because it's just straight up plus one attack and toughness to a warlord. So getting a primus to toughness five can make a difference. Uh, pre to natural speed has got a buff because it allows the warlord to now reroll the hit roll. So that's really good for the patriarch because one of the biggest challenges he had was, especially in eighth when he couldn't get any cult bonuses. He couldn't re-roll his hit roll, so sometimes, like I did, you might get uh, five ones and one, one hit, so you might be like, oh god, this is really frustrating. But now that's sort of, um, that, that's buffed, but I think they missed a lot of tricks in, in upgrading the Warlord traits to be a bit more thematic or a little bit more exciting, uh, outside of the, uh, the cults at least. Um, the relics are the greatest part of the book, I think, in terms of improvement. In, and power because there are really cool relics to the point where I think everybody's going to be running three every game. Um, so I can tell you my three standout relics that I use every game. Uh, there's one called Hand of Aberrant. So what it does is it gives your, you can put it on your Primus. It gives him an extra attack. He always wounds on twos unless it's against a vehicle or Titanic. Uh, it's two AP and flat three damage. Uh, so that makes a smashy character, which is fantastic. Uh, if you pair that with uh, Twisted Helix, you can make a really smashy Primus and a really smashy Patriarch if you're really interested in making smash characters. Uh, additionally, there's a thing called Worm Two Frowns, which you can throw onto the Kelimorph. The sad news is the Kelimorph no longer gets the Oppressor's Bane. And that is a, a relic and weapon that we always loved in Ape, but now he gets a Worm Two Frowns. Uh, and that's basically heavy one, strength six, minus three, three damage. So he can have three shots of that. Um, 
and he can get yeah six hits in total so it's quite a lot of damage that he can put out uh, but because it's a it's a bullet um and it's not a weapon he can't actually choose to use this round or not so he can split fire if i've done this read this correctly um because it says yeah you can select any number of liver liberator auto stubs to use this round so that gives a little bit of creativity and flexibility for him um one of the best ones i would say is called the unwilling orb and this is quite funny is it allows you to deny one additional power and it allows you to deny this power from anywhere on the board that's so painful <laughs> and yes yes that is really painful uh which is good timing because uh our craft world overlords are slowly making their way to the uh to the ninth edition and this just adds that little bit of extra layer so um yeah i'm i really enjoy using this um obviously it's situational but like thousand suns gray knights we know how much of a bane they are for the meta um it's let's stop that teleport from anywhere on the board so it is really good. Uh, all the relics are fantastic and phenomenal, I would say. Um, I think maybe the Dagger of Swiss Sacrifice is the only one that I would never use. Outside of that, they're definitely uh, S-tier relics, I would say. Okay, good. That sounds real good. Uh, we'll what about the powers? Uh, I think they've oh, yeah. changed the little as well. Okay, this is, I think this is one probably when people might disagree with me, but um, I'm going to just throw my opinion out there anyway. I think the powers have mostly all improved. So, um, all right, the obvious one is mind control has changed. So we can no longer mind control a big knight to kill another knight, which is really sad. I get that. Or another, an NDK to kill another NDK. Um, so basically that power now just has half of what mass hypnosis was by giving them minus one to their hit rolls uh, and also can subtract one from their leadership and one from uh, combat attrition tests. So it's not really as important as it was. Um, mass hypnosis has improved in my eyes. It no longer has a minus one, um, no, minus one to the hit roll and no longer gives a, prevents overwatch. But there are ways in the, in the stratagems to stop overwatch. So it's not as necessarily important, but it does subtract one from the attack characteristics in that unit and it prevents them from fighting first. So it gives them fight last. And for me, the big buff is this subtract one from attacks characteristics because that is almost a flat defensive uh, buff to your unit if you charge. One of the biggest challenges in Gene Stealers is if you charge your 10 Acolytes into say, I don't know, Blade Guard Veterans, um, and you don't kill them all, two Blade Guard veterans can almost wipe the squad. Uh, and, he's, and they will absolutely kill them, right? So the problem is, is if you don't trade properly, then you start losing your squad. If you lose eight models, you might have to spend two CP to auto pass morale, or you're going to run, or you run the risk of running. So what this does, it adds another layer of defensibility. So suddenly they, they might not kill eight, they'll kill six. Uh, and I really like that change. Um, I know a lot of people might not, but for me, it, it's amazing. Uh, the biggest buff for me in this entire codex uh, in terms of psychic powers is psychic stimulus, because now the unit can advance and shoot and charge, or it can shoot and charge after it's fallen back. Um, and you can ignore the penalty for uh, firing assault weapons. So for me, that's an, an amazing change because that just gives you a little bit more freedom in how you approach the game. And uh, if someone charges, um, perhaps you've got like a Ridge Runners with Blast on their mining lasers and someone charges them, you're able to fall back and shoot. Um, yep. And it's only a power of six, so it's quite easy to get. That's another thing is a lot of the powers have gone down. Um, I think Mass Hypnosis is the only one with a value of seven. Everything else is six. Uh, I think maybe there's one cult one, but that's it. So um, the sad one is Might From Beyond doesn't get plus one strength. It gets plus one attack, but it's that's okay. Um, I, I can live with that, to be honest. Yeah, sounds fair. I mean, I've got mixed fe feelings about that Mass Hypnosis, because uh, if you're making that unit fight last, it probably shouldn't even get to attack in the in the first place. So that minus one attack might not matter that much. But then again, neither would minus one to hit in that scenario. So. Mm -hmm. I guess I mean, you could call it, you could just call it a side grade. 
let's not forget it's a it's a game of dice, so it can always happen that you know your your opponent actually survives and gets to swing back. So yeah, it does matter. There are yeah, there sure. are many occasions I would say where your opponent can survive because I mean we are seeing a massive transhuman surge in the in the game. Exactly. Uh, Custodies have got it. Uh, Tyrannids have now just got it. So there are a lot of ways people can survive. And yeah, mass hypnosis, you can argue that minus one to hit can be almost the same as attacks, but someone might just roll a bunch of four, fives, and sixes, whereas minus one attack is a guaranteed reduction in damage. Um, so yeah, I, I can see why there's you know the swings and roundabouts in, in this, but for me personally, I've always thought that something guaranteed like a minus one attack would be phenomenal. Uh, and I'm really happy that we got that, to be honest. Okay. Okay, yeah, and my control does seem it's just totally different now, isn't it? Kind of disappointing. Yeah, that's it really was, sad. Yeah, it was cool to take control over an enemy unit, but then again, it, it wasn't that hard to defend against it because if you had a big knight, you'd just need to put something right next to it and then it would just get one melee attack. Well, never mind, that's gone. Uh, if I scroll down, the next page is secondary objectives. So, um, <laughs> what's your take? Oh, okay. okay so yeah. I guess it's not all positivity <laughs> then. Yeah, so for me, the biggest letdown and the one of the one things I, really wa I was really keen to see in this codex was secondaries because we have seen how impactful and easy to get secondaries in the game. Look at Drukhari, look at Space Marines. Um, they, yeah, if you get a secondary that you can just go Grey Knights, for example, even Thousand Suns if you've got a Psyker, uh, they can really turn the tide, especially in our 20-0 system, where point differential is sh way more important than it is in um, ITC ranking or just natural Games Workshop ranking system. So, the first, yeah, the, the first big page I look, went to look at was cults. The second page was secondaries. And I, my heart sank a little bit, I'm not gonna lie. So, um, all right, so I'll just give you a quick round out of, of each secondaries and how they work and, and why I think they're really bad. So the first one is called sabotage critical location. Uh, and what you do is you give two markers to your opponent and you say, right, put these down anywhere on the board that is nine inches away from the board edge and nine inches away from each other and I have to do an action with either an infantry or a biker unit and not not a character um although the reductive saboteur weirdly can do this I'm not that not sure why you would um and if I do an action and there cannot be any enemy units within three inches of that marker uh I it completes at the end of my at my end of my turn and I would score points so if you do it in uh battle round two you can't do it in battle round one. If you do it in battle round two, you score nine. If you do it in battle round five, you score three. And you can do both of them at the same time um, because it, units is pluralized, so you can do it both at the same time. Uh, but the biggest drawback with this one is your opponent has full agency on where these markers go. So, yeah, and you want to stay away from anything that puts any sort of control uh, in the hands of your opponent. Exactly. So, I mean, if it was me and I was Space Marines and I want to sit in the middle, I'm just going to be all right. I'm going to throw this marker in the middle. You've got to keep removing me in your turn uh, uh, and ready so you can do it in the next turn and you're never going to score it. Uh, if I was a Horde army, I would just put it, it probably in my deployment zone and sc fully screen out with like a 20 man squad. So you can't deep strike and do the action. And yeah, I, you, there is an argument perhaps that it takes points away from your opponent as well in this, uh, in terms of roster points because they've got to allocate units to defend this location. Uh, but if they've got an easy to score action um, secondary or like I say with Space Marines where they can put it in a position where they want to be, it really sort of falls into their favour a little bit. Also, it's, it, it's a, um, a shadow operation. So I'm ta he's taken away from banners or he's taken away from Rod. I'm just going to do Rod and take 12 points without having to break a sweat. So I, for me, this one, if, if they did it so it couldn't be in your deployment zone or you, your opponent had to pick two objectives, that's different. That would, I would be on board with that because you can play around that, you can plan for that. But when they can put it anywhere in the, in the um, it, you know, any, they can put it anywhere, 
then it just gives them too much agency. And a good player, a really skilled player, is going to punish you for taking this second error, I would say. Yeah, it's interesting, but it's just really bad. Yeah, I can see what they were trying to do with it. Um, but on the face of it, it doesn't, to me right now, it, I've tried it now, I think, in about eight games. And I've scored it when my opponent doesn't understand. But against an opponent that I've explained it and they're like, all oh, right, okay, so I'm just going to do this then. I was like, oh, oh crap. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it's been, I've been scored maybe uh, six points with it minimum, but it's not, it's a bit, the problem is, is that if they, wherever you put it, it's going to affect your game plan in a negative way. And I don't like that quick change that I've got to make to my game plan, uh, especially early on. So, uh, especially against some armies as well. So for me, I'm not going to use it uh, at all. Um, okay, so the next one is called Brood Swarm. Um, and you score a point for each of the following that applies. So maximum of four per turn. Uh, you've got to have more models within your opponent's deployment zone than they do. You've got to have more models within your deployment zone than they do. Or you've got to have more models in the middle, uh, so not in either deployment zone than they do. And you score one point if you get all three of the above. Um, and it takes a battlefield supremacy, battlefield supremacy uh, section. So that's engage or stranglehold. And you have to ask yourself, if I'm doing this, I'm already scoring engage. Uh, sure, it's one more point than engage, but I'd have to have more models in my opponents. Like, how am I really going to score that realistically towards turn four and five unless I'm really hyper trading against them a lot better? That would be a win more condition, I think. Um, or why would I not just take stranglehold and get a sort of reward myself for being where I want to be anyway? So there's a lot of questions around this one. I fully agree. Yeah, you're probably uh, better off just taking engage or stranglehold because the points are more certain. Although you might get more than from engage on some scenarios because you can rank up uh, in the later turns. Uh, but yeah, it's just it's unlikely probably. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think against some armies like, uh, for example, maybe custodes, um, there are times where you can probably really punish this one and get a really good good amount of points uh because you you know if you've got a 20-man squad you could probably build a 20-man squad with of neophytes shooty give them line in weight throw them in your opponent's deployment and force them to have to put 21 models there so they might not armies, even have that many <laughs> yeah yeah they might the knights for example they might not mm -hmm. even have that many so you can definitely there are some armies that you can do this at but then I do keep asking myself, why am I not taking strangle when that is how I want to play anyway? So I want to always flip three objectives so my opponent does not get 15. So I'm yeah, always, that's true. Yeah, so I'm always yeah. wanting to play into that. Uh, and that is my most taken secondary stranglehold. Um, although there are obviously some armies where it's almost impossible to take. Uh, it's a bit risky, but yeah, this is the, 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 the game you play. So, yeah, again, that one is probably, I don't know, like a 5 out of 10 for me. Yeah, it is situational. I, it it's is better than the one before, but it's still not great. It's yeah, but it seems, when, when we started discussing this, I immediately thought about knights, because it probably would be fairly, well, but not easy, but fairly doable with knights, uh, because there is always going to be more of you. And the thing that is important is you, you don't really rely on controlling objectives for this one. So you don't have to care whether the, the little knights have OPSEC or something like that. You just need to swarm the table, which isn't too shabby. But again, as I said, quite situational, it seems. Absolutely. This is actually the one, they're one of the armies. Um, I would I would definitely take this against uh, maybe Thousand Sons as well, or Death Guard. Death Guard is definitely one I would probably take this against because they cannot afford to be in their deployment zone. Uh, so that's a good one. Uh, knights again, if you put, even 10 man can take this. So if you throw 10 guys in there behind terrain, you're forcing them to have to come and engage you and get rid of you. And that in itself can be quite strategical if it's an on the right table. So yeah, it's definitely good against things like knights and smaller models. Um, but against most armies, I'm definitely going to take stranglehold. 
just because um, yeah, that's it, it's just it just fits better uh, for my playstyle on my army. And it just plays along with uh, the primary mission, which uh, we must not forget. So that's exactly. the biggest mm -hmm. upside of it. Right, what about the last one? Okay. All right, so this one is going to need an FAQ because the way it's worded is a bit silly. All right, so bear with me. I'll read it out so I can explain. So at the end of your turn, you can score victory points in the following ways. Score one victory point if one or more enemy units were destroyed this turn while they had a crossfire marker. That's really easy. Score one victory point if one or more enemy units were destroyed by this uh, destroyed this turn by units from your army that were set up from ambush or underground. That is also quite easy. Score one victory point if one or more enemy units were destroyed this turn as a result of a ranged attack made by a model from your army and that enemy unit was exposed naturally. That is not difficult either. The problem is, is you can't do this every single turn. So the deep strike one, uh, we have very limited ways now. There are ways to go back into deep strike, but it's an extra layer of RNG. Um, so getting one point from killing something from deep strike is going to be quite difficult. Uh, then destroying, destroying something with a crossfire marker, you can do that for five turns, absolutely. Uh, that's really simple. But doing it for a um, naturally exposed, towards the end of the game, unless you're really winning, that's going to be quite complicated. And turn one, I'm not quite sure how you do that without putting yourself in a really bad position that your, that your opponent can just like punish. So turn one, realistically, what has it got to do? If you get go first, uh, you've got to go to your opponent's deployment zone, right? And then shoot, shoot and kill something from either side. So, so it realistically have to take that upgrade that does let you um deep, let's go deep strike deep strike turn one but you have to sacrifice that unit just to get that one victory point essentially so it's yeah so it's strategic reserves right so you can strategic reserves turn one and and oh, that's fine right yeah so you yes. can't even get off the opponent's deployment edge or even in the deployment zone no. if they don't screen out correctly so that's like really really hard to do turn one mm -hmm. next to impossible Exactly. So the way you can do it turn one is sacrifice a biker unit, uh, move 29 inches. So you can move pregame of nine, move 14, that's uh, 23, and then you can auto advance for six, nine. Mm. Pray to God that you get your advance and shooting power off <laughs> and then shoot something, get exposed with their, um, with their stratagem um, and then Hope that you've made enough of a uh, like trigonometry line <laughs> that your eight inches, uh, your nine inches away ridge runner unit or whatever you decide you want to drop in can actually crossfire, and pray to Jesus that there is no terrain that's obscuring in between to cut that line off. <laughs> so all in all. <laughs> It's pretty impossible, I would say. Yeah, um, that sounds like you need to have all the planets in line to pull it off. Yeah, which, let's be honest with you, does not happen. Mm -hmm. um, not for everybody. So, yeah, so you can count that as not having to get uh, one point turn one. If you don't have the ability to get... Um, so you can still get two points because it says from ambush, and that means if you drop from a blip. So you can definitely get that. Uh, that's really easy. But then towards turn four and five, unless you're spending the CP for one strat to throw yourself into deep strike, you're not scoring another point for the next two, like, you know, the last two turns. Um, and then if you're really thin on units, you're really not scoring like another point. So I think realistically, you're going to get 12 maximum if you're being really realistic and you're doing this properly. Mm -hmm. So... They need to change something because it's really unfair, I think. Right, so none of these realistically, reliably pass that 10-point threshold, let's call no. it. So and, a bit of a disappointment here. Yeah, and I think there's an argument to be made that secondary should be scoring 10, and then if you're better, you can start scoring more than that. Uh, but then when we live in the world of Grey Knight secondaries or Oath of Moments or... Uh, Drukari's secondaries, you, you kind of think, well, it's not really a, a fair world that we live in. So, <laughs> um, 
So yeah, it's, I'm really disappointed. I am trying different ways that I can push Ambush to its limits and really start scoring 14, 15. But so far, I've only done it once. Uh, and that's because I got go second and the planets really aligned with my bikers. <laughs> so, and I was really smart with how I went back to deep strike and I got some really good nine inch charges and turn four and then turn five. And I just don't see that happening every game. Yeah. And yeah. then you won the lottery and <laughs> uh, yeah, I wish man, I wish. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a little bit of a bummer because, uh, you know, with, with a new book <clears throat> coming out, you should basically have at least uh one stratagem that allows you to step away from the generic ones something mm. to you know like a breath of fresh air in that domain but it seems that it, with this particular book it's not happening yeah i i can see what they were trying to do uh and i i respect them for trying to do it but it in practice it doesn't feel like it works i mean i'm imagining someone's going to come out in like two months time and Brood Swarm is starting to get 12 points or someone's doing really good things with Sabotage Critical Location. But right now, as I've tried to play around it, unless I'm missing something key, it doesn't feel very good, to be honest. Right, okay. Well then, uh, to not let uh, negativity take us over, let's move on from that worst part of the book into something more juicy, that is stratagems. And I've had a skim through, so the, um, there are two that deny Overwatch with different mm -hmm. conditions, so... That's that's always good to have, uh, especially with Tower coming in very soon. Um, what else is there? I tell you, what, why don't you tell me what you think is a favorite, and then I'll tell you what mine is. Oh, geez. Uh, okay, let me skim <laughs> through them again. Uh, but was there one? And I don't remember the cult ones. Uh, but definitely, it wasn't the twisted helix ones, uh, which kind of sucks. <laughs> um, you mean damage one aberrance doesn't excite you? No, not really. I, I, if, they'd not get, quite... if they'd get double the amount of attacks, then that would be situational because cards don't play. Uh, but still, I, yeah, good I, to have. I, I'm but... not quite sure what they were planning with that. Maybe they they meant minus one damage, but three attacks at damage one or two attacks at damage three. Mm, it's a tough one. Yeah. Yeah, not very interesting. Where was that? Uh, do, 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 do. I don't think I'm gonna. Is it around explosives? Uh, yeah, that was one of the ones I was thinking about. Uh, so but yeah, you one... can talk about that one whilst okay. I look. <laughs> one of my favorite stratagems is the ability to use a demo charge in melee. So, um, so I'm not going to talk about the cool stratagems. Uh, we'll not cover that. I think that's a nice surprise for people. Uh, so when they go into cults, but we can talk about cults after, but I'll talk about generic stratagems. So one of my favorite stratagems is the ability to throw grenades into melee combat. So you hit on a two plus, but for every one, one of your models dies. So it's really cool. It's got some really cool drawbacks. Um, and the best thing about it is it doesn't, even if you shot your demo charges, you can still use this stratagem because the demo charge specifically says that you can only shoot with this once. Whereas the stratagem itself says you use this in combat uh, and make attacks with it. So it's it's a it's a pure melee orientated stratagem, but it just allows you to do some nice strength eight minus three flat two damage uh, on bikers or on your um, acolyte um, acolytes. So it's a really nice stratagem. Uh, another two that really stand out for me is one is the Return to Shadows. So this is a hugely good stratagem and I, uh, I'm i really happy that they put it in. And it's two CP and what it does is if you kill a unit, so at the end of your movement phase, or it might be the start of your movement phase, some part of the movement phase, you can spend two CP and put a unit back into Deep Strike. Uh, it's worth noting that you don't get to Deep Strike within eight or six inches. This is only if you're putting ambush at the start of the game. Uh, but you do get to do a nine inch deep strike. Uh, so it allows you to be a bit more creative with your units. If say you need to emergency deep strike something. So next turn you can get um, a rod and things like that. So it adds a little bit to your arsenal, but also in the melee, the fight phase. So you can charge forward with 10 acolytes, delete a, an objective, something off an objective. And if you're not within six inches, you can put them acolytes back into deep strike. So what this does is, uh, in the, I've done this in quite a few games where I know 
I need to remove a, a unit off an objective so I get 15 or they get five or whatever. Um, but I know that if I leave them there, there's not enough cover, I'm going to lose the models. They're going to get shot, they'll die. So I can then safely put them back up into deep strike. I flip the objective um, and, and we're all good. And that for two CP for me is, is, is an absolute bargain. Um, and there's one more stratagem that I really like, which is the Kelomorph. <laughs> so the Kelomorph being the absolute hero and legend that he is, um, he's got an amazing ability where he can, he can come down, he can shoot, he can move six inches. Um, and then there's a stratagem where if he dies, he can then shoot on death. Which for me is absolutely absolutely hilarious hilarious because that's obviously him leading to his legend. Um, but what it means is that I can drop the Kelomorph down, I can shoot it with his relic gun, kill something of vital importance because he's got 18 inches, uh, move six inches. So he's come down with an eight, he's moved six, so he's two inches away from something interesting. He can then charge him, fight with four attacks, get slapped back. Uh, die, spend two CP, and he can fight, uh, shoot on death. So he can do that to snap characters. So because his uh, his relic doesn't allow you to snap characters, but his actual normal weapon does. So you can kill either a big screen or a big vehicle, charge a character, die because obviously he's only got four wings and a five up invulnerable save, um, and then pop this two CP and then shoot them and hopefully or maybe kill a character in the process. So I really like the uh, sort of flavor around this one. Yeah, okay. So I've had a skim through and Return mm -hmm. to the Shadows, you've already mentioned that. That was uh, one that I liked, but one that you haven't mentioned was uh, Just Out Consciousness, uh, where you can just put off a pull off a blessing from your <clears throat> deployment zone on a uh, unit wherever it is. So this for me is probably my most used stratagem in the entire book um, because I can use it every term. And my Magus, to be honest with you, the Magus has two casts, but most of the time he's only casting once. All he's doing is I'm giving an Acolyte squad that dropped from Deep Strike um, plus one attack, or I'm giving a Biker squad or a Neophyte squad somewhere on the board, uh, fall back and shoot. And for one CP, so you can do it outside of deny range and to bust something, it, uh, pair that with a, um, a familiar that allows you to reroll a field psychic test that is an amazing stratagem and i'm glad you pointed that out because it's it, for one cp as well it's phenomenal it's absolutely fantastic yeah it's still and i was gonna correct you about that color morph moving after after arriving on the table but i'm just looking at the data sheet now it explicitly says mm. you can do it damn it mm -hmm. i think i'm going <coughs> to play this army it sounds super exciting so there is there is a, a case to be made, and I think I think I need to look at the rule more um, because I'm I'm not done it myself, but there is people saying that they, they've done this to drop him down, shoot him, and then move him into a vehicle. Um, um, how so? You mean like engage some? Vi oh, no, 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 oh, no, uh, you mean get in? Get okay. into a vehicle. So into a transport. Um, yes. Yeah. It doesn't it, look like it's uh, the, not allowed. The, yeah, the ability specifically says even if it arises reinforcements, it can move. Yeah, and it's a normal move, so and it's not a phase that you just go out of a transport, so might as well get into one. Yeah, exactly, and stop him from dying. Um, I mean, you are guaranteed that if that vehicle blows up, you will roll a one and you will die. Uh, <laughs> uh, but outside of that, yeah, it, it's a good strategy. It's a good strategy, I would say. Um, just make sure you've yeah. got some meat shields inside of that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just do what I do. Make sure you've got five aberrants and roll three ones for your aberrants. It's easy, right? <laughs> it, 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 yeah, it sounds even easy. Listen, listen about. Uh, yeah. Danny, uh, a quick question from uh, a GSC newbie. Uh, roaming engagement, was that always there in the codex or is Fire and Fade on Bridge Runners something new and how do you assess it? Um, so roaming engagement, is, that's the one where if you shoot, you can move seven inches. Exactly. For two seconds. Um, so yeah, that one's actually really new. Uh, there used to be one where a biker squad could move, uh, but couldn't charge afterwards. But this one's really good. This one's really new, and it's it, it's really good. And I'll tell you why. Um, so one of the big things for me with uh, things like bikers because they're really cheap and um, ridge runners is that they've got really intense good movement. So a ridge runner moves nine inches before the game starts, and then it moves either forty. I 
14, I think it moves, or 16, I think it's 14. Uh, and then the biker does the same thing. And what I've found is a really good strategy is moving bikers up the, up the board. So I, I take two, two lots of five and that's it. Anything outside of that for me is a bit wasted because the damage significantly drops the more biker squad you add in because you want to use a couple of strats on them, blow something up to the high heavens, um, and then that squad will die. So what I tend to like to do is I like to move my bikers, blow something up, spend the CP, move them seven inches, and just roadblock, whether it's a, a Dreadnought or a vehicle or just general big chunky boys or even um, uh, tearing in monsters and just stop them from getting out of their deployment or towards threatening one of my objectives. Um, or what you can do is if you're against, I don't know, knights, for example, you might have your ridge runners set up that they can shoot a knight, spend two CP, move your three ridge runners back. So your knight, they can't be retaliated upon. And this little sort of interaction just allows you a bit more creativity and flexibility about how you, uh, you can really take advantage of movement. Because as we all know, movement is, the game is one in the movement phase and being able to move extra movement just adds so much layer to what you can do with the army. So I think it's a really good strategy. So would you consider ever using it to score secondaries, like engage, for example, you know, yeah, shoot, yeah, you know, and then move to the another section of the table or something like that? Absolutely, absolutely. You can use this. It's, uh, so uh, it is worth noting you cannot charge after you do this. Mm -hmm. um, but then at the same time, that's also really good because, yeah, like you say, you might be on the line to get a um, uh, what you call it. You might be on the line to get a um engage or you might you might be able to you might be right near a second uh, an objective and look and be like oh my opponent's got no obsec but i've got he's got three models i can fit four models on there with a seven inch movement but i'm not going to lose my unit because i'm not charging so you can do that as well there's a lot of different different things that you can definitely do to abuse it and uh, if you can get victory points with cp uh yeah you should absolutely do that i, I would say and the more the more we talk about it, the more I adore the toolkit that this book gives you. This book has a phenomenal amount of toolkit. Um, I, it's is for me, it's almost on par with what, if not better than what Harley Quinns were offering in the Eighth Edition book. Uh, there's a there's not anything that's a standout. This is overpowered. This is broken. How can they have this? But there's a lot of small, unique tools that you can do to just really drive this codex a little bit further than it it could go and I, I really love that because the more creative and the more thoughtful you are around it the, the better the codex is yeah it does sound fun really right um, you sound so enthusiastic when you say that no because that's you know he's I, I already imagining like the, the amount of money that he will have to spend on the army so oh yeah, yeah. good, good <laughs> luck with that by the way it's not cheap <laughs> No, I, I'm generally uh, not very emotional, uh, even if I say emotional words. Um, never mind that. Uh, Calcrete up next, because okay. uh, time seems to be pressing. Uh, okay, I don't know, yeah. I'm not counting, but yeah, there's still a little bit of ground to cover. So um, if I may, just uh, as an introduction, uh, the named cults really seem to get uh, everything they could, unlike uh, we've seen in Thousand Sons cults or Grey Knights Brotherhoods. Cults actually get a warlord trait, a relic, a psychic power, and a stratagem. All right, and now it's over to you. What's your favorite one or two? You get to pick two since uh, we don't have the other planned guest. <laughs> okay, so a quick thing to mention is that for me, one of the biggest improvements in this book is cults. Uh, so in 8th edition, I, uh, the 8th edition codex, I only ever ran two, and I was constantly changing between paupers and bladed cog based on what the um on the meta was if it was an imperium and admec based meta i would go uh bladed cog if it was a minus one damage i would uh and or ill heavy elite i would go paupers and i was really sad because i didn't feel like there was flexibility in what we could take now apart from twisted helix in my eyes there's not really a bad cult they are all really really good and they all provide a different kind of Playstyle. So, uh, for example, if you want, for me, this some people might uh, disagree, but for me, Hive Cult allows you to really do well with a vehicle spam because you can fall back 
with vehicles and shoot. Yes, you get a minus one, but if you want to rock nine ridge runners with mining lasers, you can now do that. And they negate the whole problem I had with them in eighth edition was blast in melee. So you can abuse their movement and really move forward and charge and roadblock with this really sort of um, massive board space that you would get from ridge runners. And that's why I never run them. But now you can do that and it's phenomenal. Um, you can go really defensive with your bladed cog and get five up invulnerable saves on three units or you can go quite efficient with your melee and still get a five up invulnerable on obsec with um, paupers or you can build a really quite a tanky mech list with rusted um, rusty claw and rusty claw for me is probably right now my favorite um, although i will say this i'm not using a single named cult but rusty if i had to pick one rusty claw is really good um, because you can uh, really do drive-by demolitions, which I absolutely love. Uh, I think Inescapable Decay makes things like Flamers or um, um, Auto Guns really good because you can give minus one AP to with their psychic power on any unit. It's no longer vehicles, so that just makes Flamer Bombs quite a bit, quite scary or twenty Neophytes quite scary. Um, but you can ignore AP one if it's AP one or two. Um, and you can advance and shoot without any penalty. So, uh, because you can't as having remained stationary, you can't advance and charge, but you can advance and shoot. So you can be really um, maneuverable with your bikers and your uh, ridge runners and your, um, uh, your uh, what do you call it, your rock grinders, which we're going to be using. So it's really good. I, I really enjoyed that one. Um, the Waller trait is a bit questionable because I'm not sure that you would put mass neophytes into this and it i uh, know the sorry the wall trait is actually really good wall trait on this one i was thinking of pipe cult uh i'm getting confused sorry uh, so this wall trait allows your warlord if it hits uh a six you get two additional hits and it improves the armor penetration so you can make quite a nice smashy primus with this one um where if you roll like four sixes you're gonna get like an extra eight attacks or whatever with a flat free damage weapon, AP3, and it's really funny. Um, but for me, I, I really like the Rusty Claw. My second favorite uh, is Twisted Helix. No, I'm joking. It's definitely not Twisted Helix. Uh, my second favorite is maybe um, either Cult of the Four and Emperor, purely for Undermine or the fact that you can reroll charges, um, or probably Hive Cult because you can perform actions and shoot. So, um, yeah, for me, that's really good because, uh, like I say, you can put this on a vehicle and bike a list, so vehicles and can get, um, they can fall back and shoot, which is really good for uh, mining lasers, but also they get a nice stratagem there. You can just give crossfire straight out for a vehicle. So if a vehicle falls back and shoots, you can just give it straight out plus one to hit, so you're hitting on fours, or if it's in combat, you can get plus one to hit, or if you're just struggling to throw crossfire markers around, you can just, it's a nice touch that you can add to a unit. Um, so that, yeah, I really like, but the relic is why I like it, is because you can give a patriarch uh, this relic, and every time it makes a melee attack, an unmodified wind roll of five plus, you cannot make a single save and throw. So that's invulnerable or normal. Uh, and a patriarch naturally re-rolls wind rolls. So you just, roll as many five ups as you can and you can just smash anything so that can be really fun what would your favorite cult be i was really looking at that twist the twisted helix oh god although <laughs> 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 although yeah the power and the stratagem suck so um mm. so yeah there is a there really is a there is a good thing improvement. yeah there is the one good thing about the twisted helix is uh, I think that if you want to make smash characters and you just want a fun game and you just want to see your Patriarch and your Primus just smash something to death, then I think the Twisted Helix is good because you can get flat three damage or four if you roll sixes with the Patriarch, but you can give him the Bio uh, Fagus buffs. So you can give your Patriarch five up feel no pain and extra hits on sixes. So you can make quite a. Um, you can make quite a, a smashy patriarch 
but quite a, a tanky one as well. Um, and then you'd obviously have plus one strength, plus one movement, so he's going to be moving nine inches. Uh, and I guess what uh, I guess transhuman of one to two is always nice. But outside of that, outside of making your patriarch good or maybe your pure strain gene stealers, because that seems what everybody seems to like at the minute, uh, it's not really that good because the, the the sidekick is really crap and the, the power is uh, the strat is really crap as well, to be honest. Yeah, it's even worse than the power. So <laughs> it doesn't offer much, unfortunately. I mean, uh, if you'd go like something for combat, then that's all right. But it doesn't seem the army doesn't seem to work that way anymore at least uh, the shooting seems to have become viable so you probably want to take advantage of it especially that uh, that crossfire mechanic also supports your your combat uh, mm -hmm. some of the stratagems uh, you, there is a stratagem to make a unit fight last but it needs to have that crossfire marker or was it yes yeah, so uh, yeah, yeah there is a so... stratagem that allows you to fight last or no overwatch on a unit with a crossfire marker uh, so it's always mindful to be aware of the crossfire system. Of, of, I mean, our entire codex is built around it. It's always good to be mindful of that aspect of the crossfire system that you always want to have one crossfire marker for your fighting. Uh, there, is a good, there is a positive side to that, is that the Nexus is probably the character that will give you that marker because one of his, one of his abilities is allows you to drop a crossfire marker on any of enemy unit on the board. So uh, what I use him for is basically to drop a crossfire marker on whatever I want to charge. And then I don't have to worry about having to get that crossfire. I don't need to spend points on my, on to get flamers on acolytes to, to proc it. I can just, and then accidentally kill units and then and models and then make a longer charge. I can just be like, right, he's going to strategically put this to wherever I need him to be. And then I can get that stratagem off without any problems. Um, but it is worth noting as well, we do have two lots of fight last and then that with metamorphs really allows us to trade well into me uh, melee armies um with that being said is it worth to talk about the custom coats um yeah it probably is i was gonna <clears throat> ask about them so uh okay. please go on okay uh, first things first uh is, it may be worth people noting that if you put a if you take a normal named coat you automatically your psychers get that psychic power so you don't have to worry about it taking a slot. You will automatically get that psychic power. So that's a nice bonus. I just wanted to throw that out there. Mm -hmm. um, custom coats are the strongest thing in this codex. I will say this right now. Um, I think they are incredible. And there's one combination that I, will, I don't think I'm ever going to change unless they nerf it, which they probably will because it shouldn't be this, this like this. Um, so custom coats is a really unique system now, I think. You get... A uh, number points value for each custom cult, and you have a maximum of four points that you can spend. And so you can mix and match. You don't have to take only two. You can take four uh, points uh, of uh, point ones, or you that's can take what those Sorry. numbers. Man, uh, yeah, I didn't bother to read it. <laughs> ah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, um, no, it's okay. Yeah, no, it's a really good system because I think it's, it's quite unique and it allows you to really dive in there. And obviously the drawback is you don't get a cult power, a cult strat or a cult warlord trait. Uh, but honestly, I don't think you need them uh, or a cult relic uh, because these are all you need, I, I generally believe. Um, so you can make a nice shooty list using these cult traits or you can use a nice mech list because there's quite a bit of um support to vehicles or you can use my favorite combination uh which i'll tell you now is impassioned and industrial affinity and the, impassioned is three points uh, not sure why uh, and industrial affinity is one point and i'm not sure why um so in uh, impassioned allows you to make if you make a melee attack um if you charged you are charged or you heroically intervened you add one to that hit roll which is nice it's a nice bonus we're space walls right so mm -hmm. you can add one to that hit roll. Tweak, you'd enjoy that. You get to play Space Wolves as uh, Acolytes. So four armed Space Wolves, that's what you want, right? That's what I'm going for. <laughs> that, that, is, that is the dream. That is the dream. Um, however, if you pair that with Industrial Affinity, each time a model with this creed makes an attack with an industrial weapon, so that's not, a sh that's not shooting, that's not fighting, it's an attack, you can ignore any or all hit roll, ballistic skill, and weapon skill modifiers. 
Uh, and I guess for a lot of people on the face of it, that might not sound that good. But when you look at the list of industrial weapons, that's all heavy weapons for acolytes. That's all um, most of your heavy weapons for your ridge runners, apart from missiles. That's all heavy weapons for your um, uh, your rock grinder. That's the heavy weapons for your neophytes. That again sounds like a copy of a stratagem that Space Wolves have. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. This is literally Space Wolves. I've made Space Wolves 2.0, and I, we are better than Space Wolves now. Um, and it also includes the heavy weapons. Uh, part, I think it's just the mining laser for the um, for the bikers. But what it essentially means is when I charge with rock cutters, which are strength times two minus four, flat three damage, but minus one to hit. When I charge or I am charged, I am, no matter what, hitting on two plus with rock cutters. When I, am, when I sit on a field and I want to shoot my seismic heavy seismic cannons from my um, rock grinder, as long as I put a crossfire marker onto an enemy unit, it does not matter if you've got minus one to hit or I'm shooting through forests, I'm always hitting on a three. So I can always uh, ignore the penalty to shoot a vehicle with a heavy in combat so i can always hit on fours um it's really phenomenal i think it's absolutely fantastic because it, the problem as i first mentioned when we did this was one of the biggest challenges with gene stealers is the the lack of efficiency but what this does it really drives hyper efficiency uh within the army and i think this is probably the most broken interaction in the entire codex and i, I think it's amazing who needs Van der Hammers and genetic modifications when you can just be a miner with a brain parasite and a black and decker? Exactly. <laughs> black and deckers in this meta are just brokenly strong. They are the new meta. Right. So um, I have to ask because I, I didn't quite get that. So you can uh, mix and match however you like with four points to spend on the uh, custom cults. So you can take uh, four ones. For you example. can take up to four points. So if there if splinter cult costs four, you can only take this one. But then again, if something costs three and something costs one, you can add them up and have four. Yeah, but yeah. you could take four ones as well. Yes, yeah. Absolutely. Um, okay. Absolutely. Uh, well, so yeah, it's, it's really cool. Yeah, there's a lot of combinations you can make. Mm -hmm. Uh, right, uh, okay, well, working through the book, uh, it's kind of lastly, but it's not the end of uh, what we've planned. Um, the units, so has anything changed significantly? Or, yeah, obviously, uh, both in good or bad ways. <coughs> or we can we can twist that <coughs> question, and, you know, I think there are like 21 um, issues, units, yes. unit entries in the book. Are there any ones that you think will not see play? Um, no. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. The, um, the, the internal balance of this codex is so good that there is a place for every single unit, even the Abominant and the Locust. Uh, I would say that the worst unit is probably the Jackal Alphas, um, because she, the Sanctus is a sniper that auto hits. Uh, the Jackal, for some reason, is not a sniper that auto hits. Um, and her buff is only for Kua, so... Uh, she's probably the only thing in this codex that doesn't have the most play. Um, but then people that like the model will take her because it's still a sniper um, and she can still charge if she falls back, not that you want to. Um, but yeah, if maybe you're struggling to put in uh, crossfire tokens, um, then you can include a jackal. But outside of the jackal, everything else is, I think, really good. Had improvements left, right, and center. Uh, I can give you a couple of standout improvement units um, if you want. So the first one I would say is pure strange gene stealers. Um, the problem with them was in eighth was they never benefited from cult. So they were really crap. But now they have a four plus invulnerable. They continue to advance and charge and they benefit from cult. So they hit on twos. Uh, AP3, damage one. So I think they're a really big fan, fan favorite right now. Personally, I don't use them because I don't like the models, but they are, if you want to use them, they are absolutely phenomenal. You can combine them with the pregame move. So you can move eight inches, uh, pregame, move eight inches, advance, and then charge. So if you get turn one, boom, you're already in your opponent's deployment. 
uh, tarpitting, wrapping stuff up, deleting a unit, whatever you need to do. So uh, yeah, they, they are probably one of the most improved units. Um, outside of that, for me, the most improved unit, I would say, and I really suggest people should use three of them, is the Goliath truck. And mm. the Gal yeah, yeah, you, exactly. You know, the Goliath truck is amazing um, because it's, it's still uh, not Goliath truck, Goliath rock grinder, rock grinder. It, it's, it's half 11. You know what you meant. <laughs> yeah, thank you. You all know what we mean when we say truck, you know, we mean rock grinder. So for me, the biggest change is the fact that he's now weapon skill three, not weapon skill four, and he gets cult creeds. So my trusty, trusty Goliath rock grinder is charging through, he's hitting on twos. He's strength eight. He's got eight attacks on the charge. Um, he's minus two. He's damage two. And then he's also got a heavy seismic cannon. He's the only weapon uh, uh, unit in the entire codex that gives a heavy seismic cannon. And this is such a strong gun when you put that. So it's, it's either strength six with six shots, minus two, damage two, or strength three eight, uh, with three shots, uh, strength eight with three shots, uh, minus three, flat three. And so he's usually hitting on threes, wounding on twos with either profile against whatever, you, you know, the right things that you shoot. Uh, so he does a lot of damage. And then he's got a minus one damage uh, as a defensive. He's now got a three up armor save. Uh, and he moves 12 inches instead of moving his usual 10 like he did in the last codex. So and all of these weapons, apart from the, uh, the heavy stubber, they're also industrial weapons. So I can hit on threes or twos in melee with anything uh and i love that i just love this model it's like it's our own version of a dreadnought but it's cheaper it's 110 points uh, i can tell you right now actually uh i've got it, it written down in my list it's 115 110. if you take uh demolition charges yeah it's which good, i think a good price it's a really good price and i think most people would take a demo charge because a you can auto explode uh and b uh you can throw pure strains in there and they are now smart enough to throw grenades <laughs> out of them so that's always a nice interaction um so for me that is the second most sort of uh improved unit and i think the last one I, I would mention that is the most improved is definitely the bikers um because the the good thing about the bikers is they they have an innate minus one now so it's not just shooting uh they move 14 but they have the nine inch pregame so they are quick uh mostly they fall back and can shoot and charge if they fall back and it's mostly that they're just there that they can just go forward they've got an ability that they always count as something within six inches as exposed so they've always got plus one to win within six inches so when you're throwing your demolition grenade uh with a stratagem becomes full six shots uh with a stratagem it's also damage three um you can give their core so the primers can give them rerolls of one to hit and wound from anywhere on the board if you stood next to a nexus so they are a one pump gun sort of unit they move forward they blow something up to the nether um and then they can move again for 2cp or they can also for 2cp give a unit within six inches an enemy unit a exposed marker on them so anything else that wants to shoot say there's two knights together they can go kill one they can put an exposed on another so your units can shoot that and it's, it's, they just really line up so many combinations, especially for a, a turn one, turn two, which is just really good. Uh, and for 12 points a model, so that's six points a wound, is cheap. And, and now ones. with the it's new cheap. secondaries, with the new secondaries that are coming, I think bikers will be able to do missions as well. So uh, another sort of advantage going their way. Exactly, exactly. You could definitely be able to do rod turn one if you wanted. Uh, you could just have six, you could just take six jackals in a squad, throw two demolition charges or one demolition, keep it cheap. Uh, uh, you could take them in a certain um, cult, which allows you to shoot and do actions. And they can go forward and do one hard quarter turn one for you. And that would be really good. For, you know, it's really good for them because they go 23 inches. They can go 23 inches. Um so yeah they can really just go out and do something and yeah they've just got really good value for their points now so yeah points that's because I'm, I'm still trying to find like a major flaw in this army and you you said you've played a, a certain amount of games already so i don't know if you know the points by heart by now probably not yet but you know when you structured the lists 
did you have a problem uh, to fill them in with 2000 points on the nose or like were there any units that you felt were overpriced not worth taking because of their price maybe okay so you do mention that you're looking for a loophole or <laughs> you're looking for a negative uh you just found one points have increased on almost everything um the there are a couple that have gone down in points uh so the abominant has gone down from 110 to 80 so that's a nice change but almost everything else has gone up in points um who you talk to will change depending on th whether that's a good thing for each unit will depend on who you talk to so for me the nexus is severely undercosted uh the uh, the the sanctus is pretty undercosted but some people might turn around and say hey no actually that's ludicrous the Sanctus is 70 points. Uh, he's just a one-shot sniper. Why is that undercosted? Or the Nexus just buffs a unit. Why is that undercosted? Um, but th they are mostly because the Sanctus cannot be shot within 12 inches. So every game he sits on an objective and scores me 20 victory points. Uh, so for me, 70 points for that, that's undercosted. Uh, the Nexus, uh, he can put a, a crossfire marker anywhere on the board. He can give uh, rerolls of hit of one and one un uh, to two units anywhere on the board with a Primus and um, one, a reroll of one to wound to one uh, uh, core unit anywhere on the board. And he can also CP regen of five up. So that, if that's not worth 50 points, what is, you know? Mm. Um, so I think that's really undercosted. There are things that are overcosted, like the Patriarch at 140 points. I, I just cannot justify him in my list. I'm sorry. I just cannot take him because for 150 points, I can add in a um, acolyte squad with rock cutters that can deep strike, um, you know, within eight inches, and or they can pre-game move straight out, straight out, which is a, stra a strategy I really suggest people play around with. Um, so I can't really justify a, a, a patriot because he doesn't give fearless anymore. So he's six attacks. Yeah, he's got good melee, but he's still six attacks. Um, 140 points for me is extortionate. Um, so for, yeah, for me, he's expensive. Of everything else went up in co points cost, but I don't always think it's necessarily a bad thing because of the buffs that the army's got. Um, the Kelimor, for some reason, did not increase in, in point cost. He probably should have. The one that I think is probably uh too expensive is probably aberrant and trucks i don't know why trucks went to 90 points from 75 uh yeah they, they gained plus one to their armor save is that worth 15 points N no mostly because we need them to survive so i don't know why it's, it's 90 points we don't fly uh we don't have a d3 plus three cannon strapped to the front um auto cannons yeah they're pretty good and they've got crossfire but you know I don't think it's worth 90. Um, but Aberrants, Aberrants are, all right, so I'll say this. Aberrants are, I started out thinking, oh my God, I can finally field them. I've just finished painting another 10. But then I tested them on TTS and I'm sat there thinking, what? Well, I just can't justify them right now. Um, there is a skew build that you can go where you can buff Aberrants, give them a five up in vulnerable save, a five up feeling of pain. And yeah, that, that 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 really works for them. But in my build, in my cult, I just cannot justify them because the 30 points for two attacks, they don't get really get a save against anything that wants to charge them. So it's basically 15 wounds at minus one damage. Toughness five, uh, but two attacks again, it's it, when you compare them to a grotesque at 35 points a model, uh, who have four wounds, five up in vulnerable, uh, five up feeling no pain, a six up in vulnerable save, Minus one damage in their cult, four, uh, five attacks. All right, yeah, they're strength uh, five, minus two, two damage. Uh, so they've got less strength and less damage, but that defensive profile for five points extra is like, come on, you know? Yeah, that, that point cost still makes you scratch your head. It really does. And then, so if you look at, if you compare some things, then the cost don't really make sense. But for me as an army, uh, if I don't look at anybody else, I think, okay, it's not as bad as the point increase is not as bad outside of the patriarch is not as bad as it appears all right so I, I think we're okay so so that's one kind of points the second one that i wanted to ask about uh when you played your games uh have you ever felt that maybe you were missing some cps <laughs> 
Um, yes. All right. So, uh, yes, yeah, CP regen, CP, CP, CP. So we are a stratagem hungry army. Our stratagems are so phenomenally good and you want to abuse them so much that I can easily drop three, uh, six CP in one turn. Mm. Uh, uh, the biggest challenge I found was when I first started playing the Ninth Codex is I was running out of stratagems, uh, CP by a, uh, turn three. Yeah, you can, you, can, you can run into that mm. trap, I guess, with, especially when you have a new army and you're trigger happy with everything that you have. Exactly. And I had to take a step back and think, right, uh, after like five or six games, I was like, right, actually, this is where I'm really going wrong because I really need to keep them stratagems. Um, I made a lot of redundancies into my armies that if my frontline range damage, like my jackals or my, um, my ridge runners, if they die, I've got like a little squad of, for example, five acolytes with a demolition charge uh, that can run forward and for two CP, they can blow something up as well. So I've had to take a step back and think, actually my man management of this whole system of, of CP is completely wrong and I need to change my approach. And I have, and he's working a lot better now. Uh, but I would say to people, if you're gonna play, be a little bit reserved. Think about what you wanna do per turn. Is it really necessary to throw six CP in one turn? What is it actually gaining you? Because you'll find as the game goes longer and you start to lose units, that is when you really need to um, be more efficient with your list. Because yeah, we are, an army that as we lose more units it gets more and more difficult to bring the game back and you don't want to overcommit yeah and you don't want to overcommit so my suggestion is always all right use a combination that can explode that can blow up a unit that is either anti-tank if that's what you're spamming or anti-infantry sure but then after that just hold yourself off till maybe turn three and reassess what the situation is with the um table do you feel like you're going to need to really pull out out more stratagems towards the end of the game when it's maybe moving away from you and you've lost your key units and you can like use a little five-man squad to just you know kill something off an objective or or kill something that is going to you know remove the rest of your army uh, i think it's worth considering okay uh, then i think we you know we we need to be conscious of time so i'll ask oh, my last question and then uh joker can jump to his so basically how do you feel this army is going to fit the meta right now. I mean, you yeah. know, the meta probably is going to change soon with the release of, well, new codexes and new oh, chapter approved. Mm -hmm. But still, does it still make sense to mix GSC with Tyranids, for example, or is it now a standalone, a fully standalone army and it makes no sense whatsoever? What are the hardest matchups? What are the easy matchups? Okay, so first things first, uh, Supin. Um, if you're a Nids army, you absolutely want to take Gene Stealers, I think. Uh, if you are gene stealers, you do not want to take nids because if you take nids, you will lose crossfire. And if you lose crossfire, that includes crossfire tokens and any application of said tokens. So, and 80% of our codex is built around this system. The, co the, the codex is so strong with what it can do right now that you don't need to uh, suit nids. I do not need hive guard at all when I've got my rock grinders and my ridge runners, I've got my acolytes, I've got my neophytes, I've got my bikes. I do not need, need, need a nids at all. So do not soup. It's, there's no need, uh, absolutely not, not worth it. Um, in terms of the meta, where do we fit? Well, there's still some challenges into minus one damage. Uh, like I played a game against uh, Covens today. Um, I played against uh, bikes yesterday with Necrons. There are some issues where you, in areas you don't have enough shots to overcome some armies, I would say. So I think Necrons are still a bit of a challenge, especially like uh, Gitto, who's a phenomenal player with Necrons. Um, I felt that like it was it was a really difficult challenge to play against that, and ultimately I lost it. Um, I think part of that is because I didn't really have the right game plan and I was still testing. But I think armies that are mass obsec are still a big problem. The biggest weakness with gene stealers right now is that they they're really easy to kill because most things don't have a save have a five of armor save so AP two army's gone um, but we only have obsec on two units and those two units don't survive so the biggest challenge is armies that can abuse this rule so full obsec necrons definitely can 
uh, things like thousand suns can be a challenge if the uh, if the player is good. If someone like 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 we've got Kumba, for example, if he's playing thousand suns and he knows exactly not to over commit to be a bit safer to screen out, he, they're gonna really struggle with primary point scoring for Jinx dealers. Um, there are <clears throat> a lot of meta armies I think that we can deal with. So for example, um, Admech I think now we can deal with. Yeah, they can kill us, but we've got a lot more efficiency in killing them. <clears throat> and I'm not as worried about their new, uh, you know, their, their alpha, uh, turn one, uh, you can't kill me because you I have a cover save because we ignore cover now if you expose them. Um, we've got a lot more damage into damage one when you can now spam neophytes and, and seismic la uh, mining lasers, uh, seismic cannons have gone up. So Admic feels good. Knights kind of feel good on paper. Um, I think obviously a better player, someone like Duda field in Knight, then they're really good. But we have so much flat three damage and so much plus one to wound and so much plus one to hit that we should be able to trade way better with Knights now. Yeah, um, I love I love how you said that you know um, Dark Eldar or Drukari might be a challenge, and then you went and and scored ninety three versus sixty nine <laughs> today. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would like right. to have those kind of struggles. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, that's a little bit different. Um, mostly because I'd already played him before in my first game, and I I I'm very good at looking at where I make mistakes and then making sure I don't make them mistakes again. So we had a rematch, and I didn't make any of the same mistakes. Um, I covered all my bases, I made sure I didn't have any areas to move into, I made sure I deleted the right unit this time. Uh, I play, played around the gaps and the holes and the, the movement blocking of the terrain, so I did really well um, to win that game. Um, but naturally, Drukari, because they're so, so efficient with what they can do and so much minus one damage, uh, every six up in vulnerable save, every feel no pain, really really adds up in their favor um and i i do think that it is a problem uh and unless until games workshop fix it i do think they're a bit of a counter um but outside of that i think there's not many aren't maybe tyranids uh so i think leviathan normal tyranids are not a problem anymore you're shooting your hive guard at my rock grinders or minus one damage trucks at three of armor save i'll be touching forest i think i'll be fine uh, with a 3d6 charge from 8 inches, I'm going to touch uh, Hive Guard, or if you poorly screen, bikes are going to touch you turn 1. They're not a problem, I don't think. Um, minus 1 damage, Nid monsters might be, but I, I need more games to sort of really assess that. I've had two games against them, but the players unfortunately weren't that good, so um, it, it wasn't really a good fair game. I'd love to have one with Vladdy one day, and we can then both assess you know, how that matchup looks. Uh, but outside of that, I think it, I think Gene still is a unique in the fact that they um, a good player is going to be able to beat a lot of players with them because they're so tricksy. There's so many unique maneuverability that you can do that a good player naturally is going to um, be able to beat them. So I think we're going to see more infiltr uh, is it infiltrators that yeah infiltrators more deep strike denial or specs uh, units and stuff like that are going to hit the meta. A lot of AP2 people are going to have to start spamming that because if you don't really have it um, or if you don't go anti-horde and you just go for anti-vehicle because you want to kill knights and you want to kill uh, tyranny monsters, then I'm going to run rampant with 20 neophytes that don't die, acolytes everywhere. And if you don't kill my acolytes or, uh, I'm, or my metamorphs or whatever, I'm just going to drown you and I will kill you. Uh, the, the damage is so good, but the survivability is not. So... I think it is because we're seeing a lot more monsters and a lot more vehicles in the meta now. I think Gene Steelers is a really good shakeup. Yep, you do make it sound like in the hands of a of a skilled surgeon, it's a it's a really powerful scalpel. So it is, and I really like that about the Codex. I really do. All right, uh, Joker, do you have any final questions, or can we wrap this one up? I think we can wrap it up. Okay, I'm sorry should. it's taking so long. Uh, there's just a lot of talk about this codex, I think. No, absolutely. Don't be sorry. This is, this was a blast of an episode, at least for me. I hope it is for our listeners as well. I had great fun listening to it, and I, I'm really starting to consider whether this army is my second army now. Yeah, I think a lot of people are. <laughs> <laughs> yep, definitely. <laughs> Agreed. Um, before we go, uh, 
Danny, you actually do run uh, a Reddit blog of sorts. I don't know how to call it. You want to plug it in somehow? Um, we we can do. I'm I just sort of started writing up content for Goonhammer as well. Um, nothing like nothing exceptional, just like little bits around Gene Steelers. So I think they probably would rather have content on their their website. So I might take a little bit of a break from Reddit. Uh, in addition to that, I was considering making my own blog. Um, so yeah, it's probably not worth plugging it in, but we can, I can always put my Reddit on the, uh, profile on the comment section. And then if people want to go to it, they can see the articles or blog, uh, in-depth analysis that I do put in. Yeah. We can put it in the video description as well. Absolutely. That's, that would be, that would be really nice. I appreciate that. Okay. And, um, this weekend we also have the first Polish GT of the year. Oh, uh, called, for God's uh, sake. Yeah, Danny said because he's still playing the old codex, not the new one. Due to the cat update, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, it's a 2000 point singles and there's 60 participants. And throughout my, um, well, let's call it Warhammer career, I don't remember a singles event sporting that many people. So that's quite exciting. And, uh, well, I'll try to make some sort of, um, insta story or what have you over the weekend and obviously uh next week hopefully we'll get some of the people that finished in the top spots to come and talk about it talk about the games what they took etc etc and in the this video description uh, we also post a link to the lists so if you want you can have a look through them yeah make sure you tune in next week because it's a shark tank of a of, of a tournament and there's going to be lots and lots of things to talk about uh, absolutely, I would say this. I think it's uh, it's gonna sort of highlight what the meta is standing right now uh, better than other tournaments because our tournaments generally have always have the best players in this country at uh, every single one. Whereas if you look at the US or the UK, they've got maybe one John Lennon at them and that's it. Or um, you know they can only their best players can only go to one tournament and they have so many going on. Whereas we only have like one per month per weekend. So this for me is going to be a really meta change in a meta shake up uh, a tournament because you'll decide, be able to learn actually what right now works the best and what doesn't. So it's really good to watch and, and look out for. And there you have it. I think that's it. We've covered Gene Steelers. We've got some mentions towards the end uh, and uh, that's it. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Thanks uh, Tweak for uh, helping host this. Thank you. As well. And uh, most importantly, thanks Danny for your positivity around the new Gene Steeler Codex and your yes. insights. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Great stuff. Uh, hopefully there's more of it to come. All right. Thanks everyone and goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. All right. Uh, where is that? Record? Sorry, that took so long.